All right, it's recording. Um, welcome to this webinar on contributions of <clears throat> World War I. Um, tonight, uh, Bridget Martin, who is a history teacher at the International School of Paris and an active member of the teaching and learning team of Historiana, will be giving you um, this, providing this, this webinar to you. Um, it's part of an ongoing series of webinars for Historiana, the uh, online platform of Euroclio's, um, Euroclio, the European Association of History Educators. And it's meant for advanced, user of, advanced users of Historiana, sorry. So we will be diving both into the content and into how to use the platform um, and the tools um, in your classroom. So Bridget, please, you can uh, take it from here. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start really by thanking you all so much for joining us. Um, I know that, well, as teachers, we're always really busy and the pandemic has just added a whole layer of difficulty. So I think it's really wonderful that you've taken the time, whether you're here with us live or perhaps watching the, the session. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time to join us for this webinar. Um, I'll just share my screen with you now and kick off the presentation. So uh, what we'd like to discuss today is perspectives on World War I or contributions to World War I. Sorry, there's been a few titles of the webinar going around. Um, and so I'd like to actually start off uh, today by asking you a bit of a question. So I'd like you to take a moment for me and picture a soldier serving for either Britain or France in the First World War. And really take a moment to have a think about it and build a really detailed mental picture of what this soldier looks like. So what is he wearing? Does he have some sort of vehicle? If he does, what kind of vehicle? Is he holding a weapon? If so, what kind of weapon? Take a moment now, if you can, and imagine this British soldier for me or a French soldier for me. And if you're willing to, maybe share some of the ideas that you've come up with into the chat. What does that soldier look like for you? How do you imagine that person? Anyone brave enough to share their description? Mm hmm White, young, typical uniform, a gun. Just give it another moment. Okay, seems like we're not too brave this, this afternoon or perhaps very tired. Oh, he's got a horse. Wonderful. Dark green uniform, mud on the uniform. Oh, I love that. Um, added detail. Red eyes, exhausted. All right. I'd like to show you some images now and see how they fit, ah, boots, if, poor boots if any at all, holding a rifle, wonderful. All right, so having a look at these images now. I feel like turbans, conical hats, camels were perhaps not amongst the ideas that sprang to mind when I asked you to think about a soldier uh, from that period. And I think this is where I'd like to start today and how I would suggest starting a discussion about colonial soldiers and colonial contributions to World War I with students, because we often forget the contributions people have made over time. Um, and I, I think it's important for us to question our own assumptions uh, and be aware of our own biases when we imagine um, these kinds of uh, events. So with that in mind, I am curious to know 
If you are teaching World War I at the moment, or perhaps you have taught World War I in the past, do you, or did you, include any discussion or any material on the contributions of peoples from the colonies? And I'm gonna send out a little poll, which hopefully should appear on your screen. So you can tell me, I always include this sometimes or never, just to get a bit of an idea of where we are all at at the moment in terms of including this particular set of perspectives. Just wait another minute or so. Okay, I'll stop it there and you can have a look at these results with me. Uh, so we do have three amongst us who are always doing this, which I think is really wonderful to hear. But I think most of us are falling either into the sometimes or the never category. And I think that's a not particularly surprising starting point for us today. Hopefully I can not only convince you of why it's so important, but give you some useful tools and knowledge uh, if you did want to include this a little bit more as you are teaching the First World War. Um, all right, so what I'd like to do today is start with a little bit about why um, I think it's important to teach about the colonial contributions to the First World War, and then walk you through some of the key things to consider when you are teaching about these contributions. I'd then like to go into a little bit more depth about uh, historical thinking and specifically Historical Perspective Taking, or HPT, we want to be fancy. Um, and then I'd like to pull it all together and show you um, an e-learning activity that I built using um, the Activity Builder on Historiana that tries to pull um, these areas all together. Um, so let's get started. Why teach about colonial contributions? Obviously, some of us are already doing that, um, but I think it's even for those uh, a good reminder uh, to think about what's important about this. So one key aspect is, of course, to try and move away from a Eurocentric view of this particular period of history. I think for many of us, teaching World War I come, becomes very quickly focused on the Western Front, uh, and it, you know, we call it a world war. Uh, we tend to be very focused on the aspects of that conflict. And so trying to move away from that and consider the fact that there was a huge uh, number of people from different parts of the world that were very involved uh, and played a significant role in this conflict um, and in incorporating that into our teaching. Similarly, as I'm sure many of you are aware, at Euroclio, we're very, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on making sure that education is transnational. Uh, and that we're including multi-perspectivity in our teaching, learning and activities and so on. And I think it's important that when we talk about transnational education or multi-perspectivity, that this is not only limited to nations within uh, Europe uh, or the European region, but also kind of broader um, perspectives from around other parts of the world. And the last thing that I would mention is the fact that it's actually quite historically significant. So regardless of the fact that I think we need to be more holistic in our approach to teaching this period, we also should remember that there, this was something that was hugely significant in and of itself and therefore merits our attention. So for example, over 4 million people from the colonies, and when I say from the colonies, I'm talking of course mainly about the British, French and German colonies, but over 4 million directly contributed to the war effort, whether that was in a combatant or a non-combatant role. And that alone, I think, shows how significant this aspect of World War I really was. Something else that I think is 
quite interesting to look at is this idea of the first, we'll focus on the British here, shots fired in the war. Uh, now, speaking to Helen Snelson, who I think is with us today, she mentioned to me recently um, that the first shot fired was all the way in Togoland, and I actually did some digging um, and discovered that that's partially true, but actually uh, there are kind of a few competitors for these first shots of the war uh, from the British side. So in fact, it was my homeland, Australia, uh, on the 5th of August, where the very first shot was fired. Uh, and this happened only four hours, I think, after the British officially declared war, which was on the 4th of August, but we remember the time difference and so on. Um, so from what I understand of the story, there was actually a German cargo ship that was trying to leave Australian waters um, somewhere near Melbourne and uh, a warning shot was fired by the Australian forces out of the ship and you can see uh, this is the newspaper article uh, discussing that event over on the right here um, and then subsequently uh, the ship surrendered so no one was actually hurt in that process and uh, all of the German uh, Germans on board were placed in an internment camp for the remainder of the um, the war. Then our second contender actually is over in Dar es Salaam on the 8th of August uh, 1914. This is now our first shot fired specifically against German territory. So of course the first was a ship and uh, this one was um, into German territory itself uh, because Dar es Salaam was um, controlled by Germany at the time. And that shot uh, fired from HMS Astrea um, ended up destroying a radio tower. But Helen is right to tell us <laughs> that in Togoland, we have our first rifle shot fired by a soldier of the British Empire. He is here, you can see him here, Al Haji Grunchi. He was a member of the Gold Coast Regiment uh, and they were sent into Togoland, which again uh, was a German territory at the time. He was fired upon uh, by some uh, police uh, in Togoland and he returned fire and this was therefore the first sort of land-based rifle shot of the First World War. But in any case we can see that uh, this is all happening quite early on in the piece and we find the first uh, shot fired in Europe on the British side on August 22nd. So weeks before that is really kicking off in Europe, there's significant um, of action already taking place in other parts of the world. And of course, the last reason that it's significant is that several, several of the colonies themselves formed units of war. And so even those uh, colonial peoples that were not um, directly contributing to the war effort themselves, there's a significant impact um, on those where uh, theatres of war actually were taking place in their homelands. So for all of those reasons, I think it's really important that we do teach this and also really interesting. Um, and I think there are a few things that we should consider when we are trying to teach about colonial contributions to World War I. And I'd like to take you through just a few of those now, um, many of which I'm sure you're already aware, but particularly for those that are not teaching this very much um, or not at all so far, perhaps a good place to start. Um, so first of all, I'd like to tell you about the source collection that we have prepared on the Historiana website. So you can see it's available to you just in the historical content part of the site. It's called Colonial Contributions to World War I. Mostly it's photographic sources. I think the only exception is that poster you saw earlier uh, to celebrate um, the day of Army of Africa and colonial troops um, in France. But the rest, we've all got um, photographs from different um, colonized uh, places or, or different uh, colonial, colonial groups with a real focus on French, British, but also German um, colonial troops and, and people in non-combatant roles. So the uh, sources look at a range of things. They look at the contributions that people made either as soldiers themselves, as laborers, I think we've also got a great source in there about women growing grain um, that was of course really important um, on the home front to keep the war going. Uh, and then also the sources and the, the information that accompanies it gives us some insight into the experiences of these different groups uh, and their treatment. 
I thought it might be useful as well uh, just to provide you with some useful sources for background reading. So if you're not an expert in this area, and I am also not a great expert in this area, um, these are some resources that I recommend just to give you an idea of some of the key information. And I will share these slides with you um, after, after the session today. So I won't take you through those, but just uh, there is a resource um, for you if you would like. So some of the key points that I think uh, merit attention, first of all, would be the racial hierarchies and the stereotyping that was used by the different colonial powers when they were deciding to assign combatant or non-combatant roles uh, or allowing certain freedoms to off-duty servicemen uh, and so on. So we see, for example, uh, the French actually had more colonial soldiers in combatant roles than either Britain or Germany, who were usually pretty reticent uh, to put colonial troops into those roles. Some sources do suggest that these troops were relatively well respected. We do also find source material uh, that suggests they were in those roles for other reasons. So for example, uh, there's a French colonel who's quoted as referring to um, colonial troops from Africa as cannon fodder. So we can see that even though they might have been put in combatant roles, not necessarily um, treated in the same way that other French soldiers might have been. We can also see this in the way the rankings worked, for example. So uh, the lowest ranking British soldier from Great Britain was higher ranked than the highest ranking Indian soldier. And we also see certain separations of roles. So certain races were assigned as being martial races and therefore given combatant roles and other races were considered inferior and therefore given largely laboring um, non-combatant roles. And as I mentioned here in this point, we also see a difference in the treatment uh, while they were actually in service. So the image that you see on the top right there, um, it's the South African native labor contingent. Uh, and they were sent, of course, from South Africa to Europe uh, to carry out labor and other kinds of work, uh, but they suffered probably amongst the most extreme treatment of the colonial troops. So they effectively had a camp uh, where they were kept and they were um, transported just to and from their work and back into the camp where they weren't allowed to leave or have any level of freedom, which was not the same way that other, um, other labor contingents from China or from India or from Egypt alongside who they were working were treated. So even within the different groups um, that had the same colonizing power, we see quite different um, treatment and quite different roles being assigned. Um, in line with that is also some consideration of where troops from the colonies were stationed and why. So we see primarily troops from the colonies being stationed in the Middle East or in the African theaters of war rather than in the European theater. And there seem to be quite explicit concerns there from the European side that uh, if the people from the colonies became too used to using violence and fighting against Europeans, then that could mean terrible things for them down the road in terms of maintaining their rule over these people. So for that reason, uh, there was quite specific rules about where or where not uh, they might be allowed to be sent. Uh, and then I think another thing to consider especially when we look at the diversity of experiences that these different groups had is the manner in which they were recruited into the war effort from these different territories and again this varies quite widely so we see for example sometimes this was voluntary and i know of, for instance in the french asian territories it was voluntary for people in those territories to join the war effort that said they were also promised greater political freedom uh, if they did participate and that promise was broken, of course. Um, but we also see that there was a huge amount of conscription uh, in other places, so people were not necessarily given um, the power to choose. An interesting case is the Chinese case, and we can see down on the bottom right here, uh, Chinese labourers working on a railroad. Uh, and they were indeed employed, although the conditions were extremely harsh, of course. Um, but in theory, uh, they were employed by both the British and the French. And I think they formed the, the largest labor force of the Allies throughout the war. Um, 
but uh, again, even though there was this sort of official employment aspect to it, uh, this was largely on the promise that the region of Shandong, which had been dominated by the Ger Germans, would be handed back to them at the conclusion of the war. Another promise that, alas, was broken. Um, but we also therefore see that a lot of the um, those that did enlist to be a part of the war if it did come from the Shandong region itself. So these, I think, are just some interesting and important points uh, for attention. I think also for us to consider what happened after the war. So the recognition that colonial contributions received, um, whether that was during or after the war, in this image we see um, a celebration in, in 1920, sorry, not far from Paris, uh, and it was held to honor Indo-Chinese soldiers that had been killed as a part of the war effort. So there is a certain level of recognition that does occur, but certainly I would argue at least not enough. Um, so I think it's interesting also to see how the different colonial powers uh, and how the, those colonized peoples themselves went about recognizing that. And this again also ties back to where we started this discussion of, well, why is it that many of us might not even include this when teaching the First World War? Uh, and then lastly, I think it's interesting perhaps to have a look at the implications that all of this had for independence movements after the end of the war. Mentioned already uh, that quite a lot uh, of the colonial powers attempted to persuade and people from the colonies to participate on the promise that uh, there would be greater independence and often the inverse was true um, that they really had to fight to to with even more of an iron fist um, after the war and the way that also that changed the mentality of the people themselves uh, having fought in this war and, and what that meant uh, in terms of how they saw their own status and so on. Um, aside from those sort of key substantive sort of um, issues and concepts, there's also some great opportunities to develop historical thinking through this topic, I think. So, of course, as we've already mentioned several times, the issue of historical significance and why colonial contributions are so seldom mentioned when we do discuss the First World War. There's also sort of a huge amount of opportunities to discuss cause and consequence, so how and why colonial peoples were involved in the first place, what the consequences were for them, what the consequences were for the colonizing powers. And lastly, and this is what I'd like to look at today, is the issue of historical perspective taking. And I think this is a really important um, one for us to investigate. So trying to have students think about how did colonial peoples experience uh, of the war effort differ to those of Europeans? And how did those different groups experience the war in different ways? And I think that is also an important thing um, to address with the students as we go forward, is a reminder that all of those colonized groups did not have the same experience and that uh, there were a huge amount of variables that would determine the nature of their experience depending on uh, where they came from, which race they were believed to belong to and, and what the stereotypes were around that, the colonial power that they had, um, where they lived and so on. So I think it's important to remind students that when we are taking perspectives, we have to also appreciate that there are a diversity of perspectives and there's not just one colonial view of the war or colonial experience of the war. So I would like now to go into a little bit more depth around um, the teaching of historical perspective taking before I then show you how I've implemented that in the e-learning activity. I thought I'd start us off uh, with a quote from good old Satius, uh, talking about the challenge of historical perspective taking. Uh, and how difficult it is for us to ask, well, for ourselves, but also to ask students um, to try and understand the mind of someone that lives in a world that's so vastly different from our own. And I thought it might be nice before we go on to take a moment now and see if any of you would be willing to share what you, in your experience, find particularly difficult or challenging in trying to develop students' historical perspective taking skills. So if, you're, if you've got some comments to share in the chat, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm really interested, of course, being in the classroom myself to see the challenges that other teachers face with these kinds of skills. Uh, so if anyone's willing to share what you find most difficult about this. <laughs> 
no one's willing to share. Perhaps we're all busy doing other things while listening to me. I'll just wait one more minute in case anyone has some thoughts to share and then I'll press on. Okay, so Helen's mentioning that it's more helpful than using the term empathy. Interesting that you say that um, because that is going to come up in, in some of the other research that I'd like to look at today, Helen. I know one of the, the biggest challenges that I personally face um, is this issue of presentism that students find, or my students at least, find it really difficult not to see the world through the lens that they have today and the values particularly that we have that were not always present, of course, in the past uh, and trying to have uh, appreciate, appreciate that. Books don't help, says Georgia. All right, well, if you do have any other thoughts on this, please share them in the chat. I'm gonna press on, uh, but we can of course revisit these um, as we go forward. So looking at some of the research on historical perspective taking, uh, I drew on the work of Tim Hauchen and others. That's my best Dutch pronunciation. I apologize if it wasn't quite right. Um, uh, he's, based, he's based up at the University of Honinger and he did some uh, research back in 2014 and broke down historical perspective taking into three key elements. Uh, so the first was historical contextualization. The second was historical empathy, which is interesting as Helen brought that up uh, just a moment ago. And the last was avoiding presentism. So I'd like to talk a little bit about these um, in a little bit more depth and, and what each of these elements means in terms of how we need to teach students uh, to attempt at least to take um, the perspectives of people from the past. So in terms of historical contextualization, I think we need to start by making sure that students have the necessary frames of reference. And that will of course change depending on the topic that you're teaching. But for colonial contributions to the First World War, I would suggest that this has to begin with an appreciation and understanding of the concept of colonization and colonialism. Uh, I think that students need as a starting point the First World War and its participants, sort of an outline of its causes and so on. And I think some general background about the involvement of colonial peoples in this war is necessary if we're going to ask students to put themselves in the shoes of those people. Uh, the second one was historical empathy. I think it's really important what Hauchen and his team says here around the fact that empathy is not sympathy. So especially for a topic like this, we're not actually asking the students to exercise compassion or sorrow or concern for these uh, colonized groups that uh, participated in the war effort, although they may well do that as well. But that's not the skill we're trying to develop in this case. What we're trying to develop is the ability for those students to be able to identify with those people in the past based on, and I think this is critical, historical knowledge in order to attempt to explain the actions that these people uh, undertook. So to do this, it, I think it's quite simply about having prompts and questions that require students to put themselves in the place of people in the past. And this might be, I mean, I know the typical kinds of tasks that we see in this arena are write a letter as though you're this person or write a diary entry or something along those lines. And I think if done well, those tasks definitely have their place. But I think we can also just simply ask students to um, suggest reasons why people might have acted this way or what their perspective or their experience might have been uh, in a more straightforward manner as well. And the last one is avoiding presentism. So Satius talks about exactly this issue is that often when we do ask students to write a letter or write a diary entry as though they are a slave or a coal miner's daughter or whatever it might be, we're asking them to do that without having provided them first with enough primary source evidence. And then of course, it, it, we encounter this issue that I mentioned I have certainly with my students, is that they take their present day way of seeing the world and they imagine what that might've been like uh, without using any sort of real evidence or, or having any appreciation uh, of the broader context in which that person was living. 
Um, of course, it's hugely challenging <laughs> to do this. And I think this is, in my view, one of the biggest challenges is how can we possibly let go of, of our way of seeing the world entirely. But I think what's important here is this aspect of making sure that students are given enough primary source material to draw, and I would add perhaps valid conclusions, uh, and to ensure that students are actively referring to this evidence in order to support their suppositions or their um, conclusions about how people in the past might have felt or, or the views that they may have held. So with all of those sort of aspects in mind, I'd like to walk you through now an example activity that I've created using the e-learning activity builder. Hopefully many, if not all of you, have had the chance to have a look at the wonderful video that Lorraine made uh, that shows you how to use all of the different tools. If you haven't had a chance yet, I recommend uh, having a look at it after the session. It will take you through sort of the nitty gritty of how to actually put these activities together. But I would like to just walk you through the activity now. So you can find it on Historiana under the teaching and learning page. It's this one here. It's called Different Experiences of World War I. I'm actually going to just click through it myself now, but I know Lorraine will share with you the link to the activity in the chat as well. So you can click through it at your own pace later uh, or add it to your Historiana if you find it useful. But I would just like to give you an idea of how it looks when we put it all together. So I've begun in the same way that I began the webinar today by asking students to have a think uh, about a typical soldier and then hopefully um, give them a little bit of a shock um, by looking at some of these images and considering what that might mean uh, about their assumptions or, or the perspectives that they don't give attention to in their studies so far. So there's a little bit of introductory text here. And then I've put to the students the main inquiry question, which is how did World War I impact colonial peoples? And in order to do that, I've put a few different sub questions here around the reasons for their participation, the life um, that they led during that time, and also the impact in the aftermath of the war. Now, what I think is so wonderful about this activity builder is that once you add this to your Historiana, you are then free to edit it in any way you see fit. So it might be that within your hugely packed, busy curriculum, you don't have time to do everything that I'm going to present to you today, which I would estimate would take around two hours or so. Um, but perhaps you want to just address one of these sub questions and then it's very easy for you to simply get rid of the other parts of the activities that aren't relevant for you, make any changes that you need, and then you've got an activity that's ready to go and ready for your context. Um, so I think it's important to bear that in mind as I walk you through um, this activity now, but of course it's very easy for you to adapt this in a way that makes sense for your students. Um, so I've started off by asking students to um, explore the context of the colonial contributions to World War I. So I've given them a short text here about European colonialism and then um, down below a video that comes from Facing History, Facing Ourselves uh, that gives a bit of an overview of um, colonial troops in uh, the First World War. I think it's only about eight minutes long, but you can see it's really easy to also have this kind of material embedded. And again, if you know that your students have already studied colonialism or colonization, you could take this text out because that's not relevant for them or make it an optional reading. But in my case, I thought it was really useful to make this a starting point. Uh, from there, what I've done is asked students to imagine, so it's, it is this imaginative task, uh, that it's 1914, that they live in any land of their choice that's colonized by European power and consider why they might've participated in the war. And I've asked simply for a couple of sentences or a few bullet points. And as a teacher, I could just review those responses afterwards in my Historiana. Then what I'd like them to do is check those ideas that they came up with. So are they actually borne out by the evidence that we have available to us? And I've used the highlight tool here. And I've asked students to go through, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, short texts for them to have a look at with a visual source as well. 
and to highlight any sections of that text that suggest for them reasons this group participated in the war effort and add a little annotation summarizing the reason in their own words. That's just a simple thing I like to add sometimes to check for understanding. And I've given them an example of, of the first one, what I'm looking for. So in our first source, we can have a look if we want to find out about the nature of this source. By the way, we're seeing Senegalese soldiers in Paris. And we've got some detail in the text here. So some soldiers were recruited on a voluntary basis. I've highlighted and I've got a little annotation in here. But conscription was also imposed. Uh, this was against the wishes of many colonial people. For example, approximately 15,000 men hid from the authorities. So I have another annotation here summarizing or paraphrasing my own words. Some soldiers were forced to join, um, but there were a very large number that did not want to join as evidenced by the, um, those that were hiding. So students can then click through the remaining texts and you can see it's also possible here, I find this a great feature, um, if there's a word that you're not sure that they'll understand the meaning of, for example here, Shandong is a province in China which had been part of the German Empire, you can add in your own kind of glossary terms for the students to click over as well. So the idea is they'd come through here and highlight and annotate any sections and make their way through each one of these different um, texts. This is actually a really interesting one. If you have time, I recommend having a look at um, from Gandhi, the famous pacifist um, encouraging Indians to go to war. Um, so the idea is they go through that and then I've asked them to then reflect, well, how close were their predictions about the reasons a colonial person might have gone to war? Um, in terms of what they then discovered through the evidence. So hopefully they're writing um, some interesting reflections on whether they were on the money or perhaps um, expanded their understanding of what those reasons might be. Uh, so then I've moved on to the second sub question. So again, remember, if you just wanted to do that first part, for example, you could then kind of delete the rest of the activity uh, if that was all you had time for. But I have suggested then it might be interesting to look at, well, what was the life um, of these colonial peoples like during the war? Once they were there, we've realized why they've gone. And so I've looked particularly at Britain and France uh, and not so much at the German side, just for this activity. And I've asked the students to compare and contrast the experiences of the various different groups um, that are included in that source collection. So what I've used here is the sorting tool. And I'm asking students to do two things. The first is to sort these different groups that you can see behind here into the British on the left side and the French on the right side. And then I want them to think about the treatment that those different groups experienced. So I've put some labels here, those with better treatment, and I've defined that sort of loosely as having more freedom and recognition nearest to the top and those uh, with the worst treatment nearest the bottom. And of course, a space for those that might have had mixed treatment or, or something you consider in the middle. And I've added a few prompt questions for them uh, to consider as they're trying to do that sort. And the idea is that once they're done, they can look at the similarities and the differences uh, in between all of those groups. So students can then click out of here, have a look at these different sources. Clicking on the source will open up the information on the right hand side and they can decide, okay, uh, read about um, the uh, South African labor contingent, and perhaps put them I don't know, further down here, for instance. So the idea is they'd make their way through these different sources and place them wherever they see fit. Then I've actually decided, I decided it would be interesting because the experiences are so diverse for the students to go in a bit more depth on one particular group. So I've suggested they select just one of the groups from that previous activity uh, to do a little bit more investigating on and try and take some notes on some key questions. So why they participated, the roles they played, the treatment they received, the impacts, so the loss of life, for example, or new attitudes or beliefs that emerged and any recognition um, that they experienced after the war. And what I've done uh, is give the students a huge amount of different sources to get them started. I think this is always useful uh, rather than letting them just head off into Google on their own 
which of course has its merits. Um, but if your focus is not necessarily research skills, I think giving them some resources to start from. Uh, and I tried to choose things that did have some sort of primary source material, whether that be quotations or photos or documents, uh, so that they can have a look at specifically how, how those colonized groups themselves did feel in their own words. So the idea is that they would then take some time uh, to investigate a particular group of their choice and take some notes and then have this sort of, it's still, I suppose, an imaginative task, but based now, hopefully, in a good amount of research evidence. So how do they think a surviving member of that group would feel about the war if they had survived and returned home? The idea is they write one or two paragraphs using the evidence from their research to justify an answer to this question. Time permitting, I always like then to have a sharing aspect. Again, maybe that's just not possible. Maybe you're entirely online right now. Uh, and so you'd rather just leave it there. If it is possible, what I think would be wonderful to do is then have the students in small groups. That might even be possible on Zoom or something that you take offline and ask them to share the findings from the research, compare and contrast um, the experiences of their groups, and then try to agree on an overall answer to the inquiry question from the beginning. How did World War I impact colonial peoples? Uh, and then ideally, that can be shared with the whole class, um, whether that's a concept map, whether that's a Google Slides presentation, I'm not sure. So then hopefully uh, the class is able to come together and, and bring in what uh, should be a, a rather nuanced and interesting understanding of the various experiences and perspectives of people from that time. And that is the activity. Um, so that's it from me in terms of what I had hoped to cover for you, I hope that you found it useful, but I'd love to open the floor now for any questions or any comments, um, things that anyone would like to discuss. You can share in the chat, but don't hesitate to raise your hand and you can also then um, speak directly if you feel more comfortable with that. There were a couple of um, comments already during the, um, the um, presentations um, saying that the examples were very interesting, uh, especially in light of uh, someone being a librarian developing educational programs with students and teachers. That's always a good way to, it's also a great um, basis to build something further uh, and to include students and teachers in, in creating educational activities and programs. Mm, absolutely. No questions, no comments? Bridget, I guess you were extremely clear into the point. Apparently. <laughs> all, of the, um, all of the resources will be, as I said, um, sent into an email. So if after that you have any questions, also on how to uh, adapt the activity for your own classroom, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, for more content related, I suggest, uh, I, I will get in touch with Bridget, um, as I'm not sure how much I can exactly cover. Um, and if there is nothing else, then I suppose that's it. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. It's interesting and very clear. Great, you see Bridget, the question. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, I will be following up. I will also send a feedback form. So if you also have some um, comments or suggestions on how we can make these webinars, better would you have wanted more content more tools uh, don't hesitate um, thank you very much for being online with us today and our next webinar will be covering um, visual representation of women and will be provided by dr james Siskins, who's also with us tonight thank you so much nice to see everyone online thanks everyone and see you soon I will leave everyone to uh, leave the to leave the call um, as I don't like to kick people out <laughs> of the meeting.